Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Nicole Wetbeck donnell Nicole is the Senior VP of Operations at the Mars Solution Group in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Nicole, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. Uh, for people listening, Nicole and I have been friends for, I'm going to say like eight years now. And uh, yeah. Nicole was the one that originally got me to come out to Milwaukee and work for Joy Global and uh, has done quite a bit of interesting things in the meantime and uh, kind of welcomed me to that city. And I don't know if you saw the episodes with Anna and Dimitri, um, they're all buddies too. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for finally doing this with me. This is uh, fun to have you on. Good. Cool. So I guess you told me you recently changed positions. What was, what was that like? Congratulations, by the way. Thanks. And uh, yeah, what, what kind of precipitated that? Um, so we've had a lot of growth over the past few years uh, as a company. We went from, I mean, we've tripled in growth for the last two years. So needed someone to oversee marketing operations and delivery and sales. So promoted me into that role. And now we're looking to backfill my position, which was VP of sales. I think we're going to more look for a director level of sales yeah, because uh, we want this person pretty active selling. And sense. as you know, these people, good salespeople are like almost impossible. Yeah, find, we were just so. talking about this before the cameras went on. So it's, it's a real bitch to recruit for that position in my experience. And to quote my one friend, Kristen, you get one douchebag misrepresenting the company and all of a sudden, you know, it's all bets are off, all your hard work kind of goes out the window. So uh, yeah, my experience has been, it's really, really tough to recruit a good salesperson. Exactly. That's why we've opened it to like United States and we're looking for referrals instead of, you know, going to market advertising job ads and stuff. We're looking nice. for someone who's like solid and good, which is going to be hard. <laughs> so you, when you say US, you mean they can be outside Wisconsin, they can be anywhere in the States remote. As long yeah. as they're, you know, they're good at what they do. Yeah, that makes yep. sense. That's awesome. I think that's the way to do it these days. When it comes to talent, for sure. Absolutely. Well, especially with a role like sales where you don't necessarily have to be there to be to be good at it. And it's actually, I mean, you'll spend most of your time on the road anyway. So, you know, it doesn't really Yeah, it's just finding some self-motivated. That's the hard part. Yep. Yeah, I agree. We just recruited a new guy at SKA um, who, you know, he's uh, still trying to see how he works out. Um, I think he's going to do well, but I don't know. He's got some differing philosophies from me. So we've been sort of, I've been learning from him. He's been learning from me and we've been sort of like rethinking the sales strategy. It's been pretty fun to, to figure it out. So That's good though, to work with somebody who's different. I think so too. Like yeah. um, I might've told you, like my main advisor on the business has like very different political views than me. And I won't say what those are because I don't want to ID my political views on the podcast. <laughs> but yeah. that's, we'll just say like, you know, my, my upbringing and his were very different. And so I think it makes me a lot smarter to have just more perspective. And uh, I always admire that about you too, that you think that way and, you know, like don't really get caught up in an echo chamber all the time. I mean, it's fun, you know, with your friends or whatever, but it's, it's better, I think, to get more perspectives. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's why. So some of the people I work with, our company is like 78% BIPOC diverse, um, which makes it so amazing, right? Because you're learning about different religions and different cultures. And, you know, some of our team is over in India. Oh, cool. They work the same hours as us and you build these really great relationships. Got a weird sleep schedule. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes very weird sleep schedule for them. So like an 11 hour shift? Um, I think it's, they do 10 hours. Okay, okay, that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> and it's completely flipped, right? So yep. right now it's daytime for them, but they're in bed. It's kind of like working third shift. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I, I thought about um, at another job I worked outside SK, I was considering just trying to do it from like Europe just for fun or Thailand, or just like play around with yeah. the nomad thing. And the thing that kept me from doing it more than anything, because I'm pretty sure I could be competent at my job no matter where in the world I am, except when I need to have eyes on physical hardware and personnel, is, um, you know, uh, I didn't want to have to wake up, you know, at 
I think I ran the math. It was like a six or a seven hour shift for Brussels and Belgium, which is one of my favorite towns. And yeah. it would have been, uh, don't quote me on that. I might be off by an hour, but it would have been like waking up at like two in the morning <laughs> local time and going to bed before you could do anything. So you'd basically just be missing everyone in your city. And so like, what the hell's the point of, you know, living somewhere else if you can't actually talk to people or experience that culture and get out there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So what kind of projects are you working on these days? And I guess after that, I get some other questions I want to ask you, but I'll shut up here for a minute and let you answer. Yeah. Um, so gosh, we have been, we have this program called return chip women that have been in technology left to either stay home with their kids or maybe they've, you know, not been in tech doing something else um, and want to get back into tech. So we upskill and reskill them on the development and data side. Oh, cool. And then we help get them back to work. How do you reskill someone on development? Like you're teaching them to code? Yes. Holy. So we have people that we bring on board that Badass. do. Yep. And then we do project work. So some of our clients will use us to do specific project work and we'll get those that cohort involved in it. That's cool. Um, yeah. Do you have like so a, the, I'm guessing you bill it like a lower rate for folks that are still learning like that? Because we've been trying to figure that out. Like we get pulled in when the house is on fire and there's a very small window of time to mm -hmm. deliver like a huge amount of work. So I'll be honest, Nicole, we at SK discontinued our internship program um, and we don't really do any on the job training anymore except to teach people like the project that we're adopting to, which you can't avoid. And so and I, I wish it wasn't that way. I'm actually curious how you're how you're getting around that because it, it would be good to be able to open the doors to like broader, you know, diversity of like experience, as it were. I think it's different because they they have the experience, so you're not training them from scratch, um, and they've had the working experience, which is important, right? They've been in a corporate environment and they kind of know how it works versus an internship type of program when they're kind of fresh, you have to spend a lot more time and they don't catch on quite as quick where these women are like ready to get back to work, ready to nice. go. Yeah. So what's like an example of a past life that a woman in this program would have like before learning to code and, and data entry, data science, data analytics, all of the above? Um, data analytics. Okay, so cool. they, they would have had a job already in that field and maybe they are staying home with their kids or someone was a flight attendant because they weren't able to find work. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So then they don't want to be a flight attendant. They want to get back into that. Yeah. And but they you know, it's been five years and things change in five months. Yeah, especially when you're dealing with the software world. I mean, I, I don't really do a whole lot of coding. I haven't coded in a decade, but I mean, maybe at Joy Global was the last time I wrote any code for work. <laughs> And then I, I guess I check the Git when engineers on my teams do coding now just to make sure that everyone's delivering what they're supposed to mm -hmm. because of you know who. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, um, as a result, um, I, I'm a little bit stale myself, but the last time I got into it, I remember what I saw is every time I opened my eyes, especially in the front end world, there were like five new frameworks or like, you know, 10 new languages that weren't there when I closed my eyes maybe like a year mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we just finished a project. We did a custom cohort for a client of ours for Kubernetes. So they were having a hard time finding people in the market that weren't ridiculously expensive. And they asked us to just do a custom cohort, find good, talented people, and then train them. And it worked out really well. They ended up taking, I think, seven out of nine of the cohort. And nice. so far, so that was that's that's a great months. placement, right? That's that's yeah. huge. Okay, so you take people that know what they're doing and they've done some kind of coding or data analytics. You teach them modern yeah. languages and frameworks and then you put them back out there. All exactly. Right, that's, that's pretty clever, actually. I didn't think of that. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It works out really well. You have to get a develop a network, right, for that. So at first it was slow to recruit people, but now we've become pretty well known and we have a lot of referrals. That's, That's interesting. How do you how do you network for that? Like, do you just go to events for like women in tech, or like what's your? Yeah, tool? women in tech. Um, 
there are some feeder programs in Milwaukee that I'm trying to think of the names of. There's a couple different programs, like IC Stars is a good one. What's IC Stars? It's like underprivileged kids cool. that maybe graduated high school or went to college for a couple of years, didn't graduate. Um, they want to get into coding or uh, into IT in general. Nice. So we look at the candidate base and where we think we could put them and then we feed them into our program. I like the name too, because like sometimes you do see a rock star that's kind of like a diamond in the rough and they might not have the traditional pedigree or education that you yeah, know, it's, like it's, most people are looking at. So they get overlooked. There's there's one guy I talked to who was in Amazon's, um, you know, they have like their own trade school now to teach PLC programming and like robot mm -hmm. programming and all that crap that they need to run these massive logistics centers. And I don't know how that has weathered the layoffs. Uh, you know, I'm talking out of my ass here as someone who is just kind of on the fringes and observing as an outsider. But this one guy I talked to that was in their program was really clever. And, and some of the skills they were giving him, I'm like, ooh, maybe we should be, uh, you know, piggybacking <laughs> off this a little bit. Because, I mean, you know, like a good PLC programmer is, is hard to come by these days. Or like a good CNC oh, machine yeah. operator or like a good, you know... Um, somebody that knows how to do uh, controls, you know, on, on like a, a line and can get a motor drive tuned. I mean, that's not easy skills to come by and they're all very valuable. Um, and, you know, to young people listening, you can earn a lot of money if you if you learn one of these skills and get good at it. Please go be a controls engineer. Please. Please. We'll hire you. <laughs> Nicole and me will hire yeah. you. <laughs> You'll get a job. You'll never be unemployed. That's correct. You'll get your door pounded down by recruiters constantly. You'll never have an empty inbox. and That's true. People will figure out where you live and <laughs> just be calling your personal cell phone constantly. Very true. Same with machinists. Machinists, for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. at, at my last job at, at FormLogic, uh, which I, I resigned from uh, pretty recently. Um, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> my last job at FormLogic, I'll say. Um, I... Uh, was um, the director of advanced projects and um, okay, I'll talk about it. So the reason I resigned was because they hired me um, as director of advanced projects and um, I was under the impression that that meant running an R&D team. There wasn't a job description. The job was just made up for me and you know that's how it came to exist. Uh, so in my mind it meant running an R&D group and, and creating my own department and standing that up. Um, in the uh, eyes of the company, it meant, you know, doing more business strategy decision making, which just, I mean, it's you're probably way better at it than me. It's not what I've trained myself to do in my career. And so I, I you know, tried to make it work, but just wasn't a great fit. But anyway, uh, what form logic? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm not upset. I get along great with everyone there. I mean, the CEO and I text on a regular basis. Um, Director Quali Michelle's come on this podcast uh, and is coming back on again soon. She's great. She's one of my favorite folks. And uh, we drank a lot of mezcal that night. <laughs> and um, we're going to do like charcuterie and champagne next time, I think. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. M M Michelle's a badass. I'll have to introduce you to her at some point. But um, she, uh, or what I was going to say is we could not find enough CNC machinists. I mean, we, what we were doing is running a highly automated machine shop. And what that meant was you know, coming up with unique ways to have remote machine operators running, say, like 10 machines at a time. And so it's it's force multipliers and then removing the, you know, the geography constraint that you and I talked about at the beginning of this podcast. Mm -hmm. And when we were able to fill a machinist role, we didn't fire people or whenever we were able to automate, I should say, we didn't fire people. You know, we, we bought more machines and hired more machinists. So if you come up with a way to put someone to work more effectively and give them the fun, rewarding parts of the work, and I, I don't think this was unique to form logic. I think this is something everybody in yeah. manufacturing wants to do is, you know, how do we get the most out of our folks? How do we keep them happy? How do we keep them satisfied? You know, how do we increase, you know, our onshore production and decrease our cost on shipping and customs risk, you know, or whatever, you know, makes you want to do that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, it's, it's just a good idea to, to keep your, uh, you know, manufacturing operators satisfied and happy and employed. So. Right. The misconception that robots are taking everyone's jobs when really you put a robot in and it creates more jobs. Yep. And it makes someone doing their job more interested and useful. I mean, now they get to play with the fun robot. You know? yeah. So, 
Yeah, and I completely agree. Um, and it's, you know, it's been fun to be a part of that, you know, and like I said, nothing bad to say about those guys. I, I'm grateful for the experience. So yeah, um, what are what are some of the other things you're working on these days? Um, that's a lot. No that's worries. That's what I've got going on pretty much. Yeah, I don't, don't want to like, make you go into, because I'm sure there's more that you just can't say. I mean, as Besides, the... you know, the kid in the background that I'm sure you heard crying for some reason that I don't know because <laughs> I'm here with the door closed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to take you away from your family, Nicole. No. I do miss hanging out crying. with you though. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So you and I talked about this, like when I when I first met you, and I, I asked you, but I kind of want to ask again, just for the for the podcast and people to hear mm -hmm. your story. You started out as like an engineering student and decided you didn't want to go that route. And like, how did how did that play out for you? Like, how did you yeah. end up in like the executive track, as it were? Yeah. So um, mechanical engineer. Really, my first job out of college was with an RV company designing mirror casings. So super exciting stuff, like really great. <laughs> I got pulled into HR's office so many times for talking like a child at school because I was talking to my coworkers. And then I realized that was like, an issue in their minds. Yeah, that that was an issue shut the fuck up and get back to work <laughs> yes Jeez. that was like the mentality so i was the only woman in the engineering department it was kind of an Brutal. old school company um and on top of that just you know not a good fit and i was like wait i can't talk if i'm an engineer that's a problem because i talk a lot <laughs> i want to meet people and i like people <laughs> Uh, so I quit and I took a hundred percent commission sales job. Nice. Like, let's it's see if I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Both feet and, right into the deep end, cement shoes totally. and everything. I'm just like, let's try something completely different and not tell anybody what I'm doing because I don't want people, you know, judging me or whatever, but I was really successful. I did good. I was with that company, I think for like six years, um, they wanted me to relocate and I decided not to. So I left that company and got into staffing and recruiting um, and was like, this is the greatest thing in the entire world. That's awesome. And haven't left since. So I've just kind of worked my way up the sales ladder into the executive suite. That's awesome. And can I say like when you recruited me, I was so grateful that you actually wanted to hang out because I too am a people person. Yeah, and that's one of the things about like straight up engineering jobs that I mean, I have nothing but respect for engineers and I'm grateful for all the engineers I get to work with that totally. you know, come up with awesome ideas and, you know, figure out how to solve way harder problems than I could solve on my own. <laughs> but at the same time, like personally, like you, I love to, to bullshit and be around folks and and to hang. Right. And so, yeah. The fact that you wanted to to like hang out and you were like, hey, let me know if you want to see the city. Let me show you around Milwaukee. I, I made yeah. me so happy. I was like, yeah, new friends, you know, let's do it. And I don't know yeah. if, if this was true, but at the time you said I was the first engineer to take you up on that, that you'd ever recruited in. Was that, is that actually a true statement? That is, it, <laughs> it really is. They're like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to do anything. I'm like, okay, Prudent. it's fine. Change your mind. But Once in a while we get like a coffee or something, but nobody like wanted to have fun, I guess. <laughs> You've ended up being one of my best friends. Like I've, it's so great. Like we've worked together since then, you know, like in, in different capacities. I mean, um, like, I don't know, I've been to your house, I've met your family, like, you know, yeah. I mean, you've introduced me to people I wouldn't have known. I've introduced you to people you wouldn't have known. And, and none of that would have happened if we hadn't hung out and like gotten to know one another as people. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I love, that's that. what I do for a living, right? I get to hang out with my clients and sometimes candidates and go to events and drink booze and have fun. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's the way I mean, there's other stuff, obviously, in between all of that. But well, yeah, of course, you can't just be a party animal and, and nothing but you've got to have some strategic <laughs> vision and intelligence. But you've obviously got that, too. Yes. And yes. So yes. It's, it's, I think it's a good balance. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that you're on the scene. I'm grateful to know you. I'm, I don't know. You're 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 a killer. <laughs> you're good at what you do. I feel the same about you. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. It's 
Very kind of you to say. Absolutely. Yeah. You are definitely smarter than me too. So. I don't know if I agree with that. But I oh appreciate it. You can't not agree with that. You're way smarter than I. I when Every I... time we talk, I'm like, you're doing what? <laughs> and how? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying. I um I feel like I'm a bit of an asshole that like I definitely I grew up as like a bright kid and so like I I would score on like the long tail of IQ tests and just blow the curve every time. And I, I, I don't know. I think it made me a little too cocky out of the gate where like I, I came in thinking I was better than I was when I got out of school. Like I, I was so used to like being the valedictorian or like breaking the curve or, you know, embarrassing everyone else in a math class. And, you know, like my score set the standard for everyone else. in like a 200 person lecture at, at KS Western one time. And it's a big it's, deal. Well, just raw horsepower isn't everything, though. Like, I, I think experience matters more. And, like, that's something that I would never have admitted when I first graduated. But, I mean, like, the people you know, your network, you know, your, your experiences, your ability to adapt, your, your knowledge, you know, from, like, who you've been around and what you've seen. I mean, that's arguably more important. Your emotional intelligence is more important than your intelligence quotient, in my opinion. And, like, I feel like that's something i don't know like sometimes every now and then i'll meet a kid like right out of college where i see myself in them and they're cocky you know and they think they're i don't know if you remember our negotiation <laughs> you can't even talk about it but like I, I i was supposed to be an intern at this job and i negotiated myself into being <laughs> out of the pay grade for an intern and so i i was a whole different classification of of you know person at that company you also and, had a rare skill set yeah that's fair <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think I was very much opposite because of my upbringing and the way I grew up. I was kind of never encouraged to do things. I was more like independent on my own. I got to figure it out myself. So I was always kind of second guessing myself. And it took me, I think, into my like early 30s to really be like, oh, I. I did something like I can do this. I know what I'm doing a little bit some days. <laughs> I mean, you've given me so much good advice on stuff that wouldn't have occurred to me ever. Like, I don't know. You're smarter than me in a lot of ways. <laughs> maybe, maybe in some ways we balance each other out. No, I, I think it's a good synergy as well. Yeah. I met this one guy. I had this guy on the podcast. He's the CTO of motive space systems. His name's Eddie Tunstall. And, um, this dude is way smarter than me. Like I, I was like, Jesus fuck like this how how many things does this guy know about like he he builds space robots for a living and he's um okay like understands like all the ins and outs of like the difficult linear algebra that I struggle with and like he's he could do any one of the engineers on his team's jobs but he doesn't because he's the CTO and so that guy I I and he was he was amazing to work with because there were like little things he caught in editing or like little things like, I, I think I like got like some minutia wrong on the description and he recognized immediately like just the best work ethic, you know? And I was like, okay, this guy is way smarter than me. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm a moron compared to this You said he builds space robots. Yep. Like what else do you have to say? That's his whole job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and he's been doing it since the late eighties, right? And so he's got, well, like, Okay, this is embarrassing that I can't do this math in my head, but 30, 40 years of space robot building experience. That's so, insane. Yeah, yeah. I smart. hope there's somebody training underneath that guy because... I mean, he's the CTO of a company. I'm sure there are. I'm sure he's got a whole yeah. bunch of you know, getting that work knowledge. progeny, as it were. <laughs> yeah, getting that knowledge. <laughs> I hope so. Just the, the Genghis Khan of training engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have that image now. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. So you remember how you, you found me? You reached out to uh, John Dolan at Carnegie Mellon, who's that? I don't know. How did you find that guy? Like, that took some hustle. I don't know. I Googled something. Clever. <laughs> <laughs> so he's buddies with John Dolan. That's how I met him. Like, that dude uh -huh. knows everyone. I don't know if you knew this about him, but he was he was a colonel in the Army. And so... Yeah, he did that. <laughs> that's awesome. I didn't find that out for like, I knew him for six years before like some Marine um, 
a retired Marine told me, like another MRSD graduate, was like, you know that guy was a colonel, right? And I'm like, what's a colonel? <laughs> I I didn't know what a colonel was. Yes. I was like, what does that mean? I don't, I don't like know. Colonel Sanders. Like, tell me more. <laughs> I know nothing about that. They're like, no, dude. That like they command ten thousand people. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. That's a level of responsibility I will probably never attain. <laughs> so I don't deserve that. No. Yeah. Well, and I had another guy on the podcast, Wayne Dudding, who's a retired U.S. Army colonel, and um, there's some interesting stuff there I won't get into, but. He, he was, um, what he said is he's like, you're like a 20 something year old and they give you, he told me the silver lunch one time, Hope, Wayne, hopefully you're not mad at me for, I don't think it's anything you get mad at me for saying. He's like, you're like a 20 something year old and like they just give you way more responsibility than any human can handle. <laughs> it's way more than you deserve. <laughs> like, like 20, 30 people under your command is a 20 something year old, you know, and you just kind of go from there. And, um, you know, it's, I don't know if he was a lieutenant or like a captain at the time, and then he got more heaped on him after that. But I think that's how, I think if you show you can handle it, like a ba they just give you more and more and more, you know. And, and if you don't break, they're like, okay, this person's you know general material, <laughs> or whatever. That's I like, mean, I'm saying this I, is I've never been a veteran, I've never served, I don't know. I'm just this is my observation from having friends <laughs> that are in in the. You understand? <laughs> yeah, I have a cousin in the Air Force. Um, and he got promoted to something and I still, I don't know what it means, but he's been on like six or seven tours of Afghanistan and he keeps going back and I'm like, Holy moly. what do you do? And he's like, I can't tell you. <laughs> like, are you, you really can't tell me? Or are you just saying that? He's like, no, I really can't tell Come you. On. And I'm like, just a little bit. <laughs> like, no, I can't say anything. I'm like, well, you're no fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I had a guy on the podcast as well, this other guy, uh, Brian Beyer, and he, he told me a story at dinner about robbing a bank in Iraq <laughs> in what? order to get, um, they needed dinar uh, to pay people like cops and teachers to keep the infrastructure running. So okay. they, they robbed an actual bank and then they only went after like the, the government accounts. And apparently the teller like didn't speak English. And so Brian's commanding officer got him in and I was like, hey, uh, can you blow that bank vault door off? He's like, well, we might take down the building as his TI-84 or whatever out. He's like, we might blow down the building, but yeah, we can take it out. And then the guy all of a sudden spoke English and like knew where the key was. Oh, right <laughs> yeah. away. Yeah, exactly. So the only reason I'm telling you is because he told it on the podcast. I think we're good. But I mean, you know, some of the stuff those people do is just fucking insane. Like I'll never have those experiences, you know, and, 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 and maybe that's okay. I don't necessarily need to know what it's like to rob a bank in another country <laughs> it does sound kind of cool yeah yeah for sure <laughs> Is it, i'm a big reservoir dogs fan so like anything that resembles that i'm just like yeah <laughs> so everybody wants to be mr black <laughs> nobody wants to be mr pink you know i haven't that's the one show i haven't binged yet it's on my list you mean reservation dogs or reservoir dogs reservoir Oh, no, it's a movie, but, like, it's it's a good one. Oh, what am I thinking of? You might be thinking of Reservation Dogs. It's the same font. Okay. It's on Hulu. It's, yes. It's good. I, I, I Well, I'm, like, six episodes in. I've kind of – I haven't had time for TV lately. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> I wish I did. Yeah. But I've just I'm, been – I've been getting, getting buried at work. Night. No, how is that? I haven't watched that yet. Oh, my gosh. Spencer, you have to watch that. Handmaid's Come on. Still? All right. Yeah. What do you think about like um, the current economic climate? <laughs> just, to, just if since we're we're going down this rabbit hole, like what do, what do you think is next for our, our industries? Respect. So, just to, to kind of get more into it, like Mars SG works on pretty much what SKA works on, just at a different scale and in different verticals, right? So, yeah, you guys are contract engineers. Okay, cool. Yeah. And you're yeah, bigger than us, but you're you're in like more like what do you what are your like main industries? Like what are you guys doing? We do a lot of like finance, fintech, badass. Banking. Yeah, we yeah. do none of that. So we, we focus on like field robotics and mechatronics. So like we've put robots into like, you know, operating rooms and we've, you know, built people new arms that they didn't have before. And, uh, you know, now we're doing stuff in the energy sector, which is pretty fun. And then um, we've done a little bit like really, really light like defense, like we did like navigational devices uh, in that area. but. 
I mean, you know, that's all I can really say without getting myself in trouble. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So fintech, what what else? Like any, like, it sounds like software focus. Yeah, manufacturing and healthcare. Badass. Too. Um, but more like we're doing, most of what we do is not statement of work, it's staffing. So that's where we make all of our Internet. money. So we're different. Staff. So we're like, yeah. we go TNM a lot of the time now because when we get called in, I mean, our somebody badly needs help yesterday. And so if we were to SOW it out, like our client would be fucked because we would run through their whole timeline just on the scoping. And so we used to do that. And at this point we'll do it. Like if it's, if it's something we've done before and we know how to scope it, but we don't get called for something we've done before. We get called for something ridiculous that nobody else can figure out because we're known as being the best at what we do. And so That's like, cool. thank you. <laughs> So we get called when the house is on fire and there's very little time left to put the fire out. And we just bring a gang of heavy hitters in to solve a difficult problem. And then we leave. <laughs> yeah. and so that's... And then they call us and they say, we need four software engineers, full stack. We need this. We need that. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So that's what you get, like a discrete staffing requirement. You're like, okay, we got these four people. We can, we can do this. We can do that. You go, uh, it sounds like you're mixed pricing. So you go based on like seniority level or like, okay. Yeah, it's, and it depends on the client. So sometimes we have to run through like a large vendor system yep. and then our pricing gets, you know, our margin. That would jack it up because, oh, that's brutal. So yeah. you do more work and you make less mar. That's, that's fucking horrible. I but shouldn't say that. But the volume is there. Okay, the so that's not so bad. There. Life is good. No. So yeah, then it's like a hundred people at one client. I was thinking about you. I was touring a, a plastics company cool. the other day and I was looking at their machine. They had a robotic arm that was like cutting out plastic and leaving it on the floor. And I'm like, oh, that's so much unused plastic. Like, what are you doing with that? And they're like, oh, it just goes and it gets recycled. And I'm like, Spencer could do something with that. Yeah, Spencer for sure. could fix that problem. <laughs> How much money you got to do on-site recycling would be my next question. What's your budget? Yeah. What's your timeline? So, yeah, I mean, and I say that tongue in cheek, but what I actually mean is, you know, we ask that question to sort of vet out, you know, like, are we offering the right solution? So if, if a company had, you know, say, you know, $20,000 to spend on that, you're not going to be able to do much in the way of bespoke engineering for $20,000, like, not for something like that, but like when I'm thinking it out loud for that project, it, it, you'd probably want like something like a crusher, like a, like a big paper shredder to take that plastic and pulverize it. And then you'd want some kind of a vessel that can churn and melt it. And you would have to like think about color. So does the color of your end product matter? Are they all the same color mold? If it's all the same color and you've just got yellow scraps and a yellow product coming out, then you can just pulverize, melt, auger it into like, you know, your injection mold and then stick it back in line, have heating coils all the way along and then, you know, blast it back in and recycle that way. So what it comes down to, I guess, is like how much money are you losing? It's, it's math, you know, and you know, how much is it costing you to buy new plastic versus get recycled plastic? And then if you were able to recoup that margin over the amount that you're losing, what is that amount of money that determines your budget for the project right and then maybe you look at like a two-year roi return on investment or i don't know i mean it depends right some clients want a five-year roi some clients want a one-year roi and so it just depends on that client's risk tolerance and then that's how you'd formulate a budget for that project and from there you say okay well what can we afford to do for that amount of money like you don't want to gouge like i i had a real estate agent where I was in the market for some rental properties recently. And she just asked me what my range was. And then she served me properties with no real estate uh, rental potential at the top end of my range. I'm like, why? What the, why? Like, what do you, have you even been listening to me? <laughs> like you're giving all of us salespeople a bad name. But the reason I ask what your budget is, is not to gouge people for the top end of their range, but it's to know like what solutions are viable based on their budget. You know, like, Obviously, you don't want to launch a satellite, <laughs> you know, if it doesn't make sense financially to do so. So, and that way you can present options that are within the realm of possibility and actually be useful and not wasting any effort on the front end. So, I don't know. That's, yeah, that's a long rant. My dog, sorry. No worries. Thought you it might, might be to... your pig. 
I was like hoping for the pig. No, Amazon's here because, you know, why not order everything that you own on Amazon? And get I had probably more given money. them. <laughs> this is embarrassing. In grad school, I was spending probably 20 grand a year on Amazon. Like it's, it was bad. I, I definitely yeah. had and continue to have an addiction. Like, I don't know. Okay. I, yeah, I bought a leaf blower. Like somebody, you know, messed up their car. Why? Bumper. A leaf blower? <laughs> I, I still live in an apartment because it's cheap. And so I, um, it's, I pay so little, it's great. Like I, I <laughs> the moment I can find a mortgage is cheap, I'll buy a house. But I, um, I sort of bullied my way into having a carport behind the building I rent. And um, as a result of me kind of strong arming this second structure onto the property for no money, I don't have really like maintenance for it. And so I just started blowing out the leaves myself. And it's a good way to clear my head. I mean, you, you were telling me like feeding your chickens gets your head. I don't know if you still have yeah, it. Yeah. You were saying it kind of gets you chilled out and, you know, like off the work day. For me, mm -hmm. blowing the leaves out of my carport gets me chilled out, you know, and ready for the next meeting. And, and it's like, it's like a mandala, right? Where like you, you sweep all the sand and <laughs> kind of relaxes you. And, you know, then you can, like, I like sweeping the floor. I like, um, I like, you know, manual labor in varying degrees. Oh. I like, yeah, it's, it's like just, mindless. Correct. It's almost like meditating. Driving too. Like if you have a long drive, yeah. that's the closest I get to meditation. Like I don't, I don't do well with being told to sit still and not go to sleep. <laughs> I, hard. I really, really give it a good try and I just can't get there. I can't do it either. I, my brain just will not shut the fuck up. I know. <laughs> it's awful. It's like no matter what you do, there's something going on. It's like if it's not work, it's planning ahead. Like I'm a planner, maybe like not maybe. I'm totally obsessive compulsive disorder. I know it. So I'm Probably always planning like for the next day. Like what do I need for I the next day? I do the same day? exact thing every time. Like I'm not even worried about it because I know I'll never not do it. Like even if I've had like, you know, 12 cocktails, like I'm still going to run my calendar for the next day before I go yeah. to bed. You know, exactly. like as I'm spinning and vomiting in the toilet, you know, like flying away. <laughs> like I will, <laughs> I will find a way to run my calendar, set my alarms for five to 15 minutes before my meetings, depending on the meeting before. Um, mm -hmm. I will come up with an action items agenda based on my non-time reliant action items. And I will come up with a call list, all the people I got to call that day. And I, I do that all on like, I, I use, um, I'd be curious to know how you do this. So mine is I use uh, my iPhone and I just set like timers before my meetings that are like time dependent. So I'm never late for a meeting. And then I, if, like, if you know, like, I don't know if I trust, like, I don't always trust my phone. If there's something critical I gotta be up for. I do this less and less because like the iPhone has been reliable pretty much, but when I had an Android, it was kind of glitchy. And so I would set a secondary alarm clock for like the same time and then I would have, cause I, you know, it just glitched and I, I slept through it and I, I missed meetings. But these days, I think for the last maybe four years of my life, like it's a little bit embarrassing. I, I wake up 10 to five to 10 minutes before my alarm. Like I'm absent-minded, but my biological clock works. Like when I was yeah. a kid, my parents used to call me 6-0 Spence cause I would just wake up, you know, like 10 to six, I guess like every time. <laughs> And so it's, it's, I'm finding that's coming back as I, as I get into my thirties where like I, you know, whatever my first, I don't have a consistent sleep schedule. It depends on my first thing. Like some day, some mornings I'll play tennis at like 7 AM or, you know, now that we're getting to the winter, I'm starting, I'm going to get into rock climbing. That's my, my new kind of, you know, cardio for the morning. But you know, I'll, were you, by the way, I saw pictures of you online as like a power lifter. Like, do you have a career in that area or did I find no. some other Nicole Whip back? <laughs> No, no, no. I definitely have lifted, but I'm not a power lifter by any means. I, I found but like yeah. comp competitive bodybuilding pictures of you at one point when I was. There must be another. Nicole there might Whitt. be another one that's like looks similar <laughs> enough. I got it wrong. It's my it's my alternate. Carl, YouTube. if you can find this, please <laughs> put a picture up. I, I, I find it. I, I was convinced you were like Arnold Schwarzenegger and maybe I'm misremembering this, but like. I do work out like every day, but it's at night. I'm not a morning person. Okay, so this so could have been you. Like you could have just been jacked and like, I, I, 
Okay, this might <laughs> this might have just been you. <laughs> I mean, I do. I am like really low body fat, but I Jealous. don't know about body. I'm very build. high body fat. I got quite the keg going. <laughs> No, I, I cycle, I do Together a we're ton a whole yoga, adult. and I do weights, but nothing crazy. Yeah, that's uh, that's wild. I mean, that's really cool. I got to get into that more. I thought about getting a trainer. Um, tennis was great for me, like, this last season. I, um, I hadn't played since the late 90s when I was a kid, and, like, I got back into it, and I've just been going hard and waking up at, you know, like, 6 a.m. and playing tennis at 7, and I know that other people wake up earlier, but fuck you, you know, yeah. <laughs> this is the compliment for me. Yeah. yeah. And so, but what I found is, and I'm sure you found this too, like, well, you're doing your cardio late, but when I do cardio at the beginning of the day, like I, I, I perform better that day. Like I, you know, I mean, I grew up with like an ADD diagnosis and I, I recently quit um, the Adderall, you know, and I, I've just been going without it and nobody's complaining. Like, I think I'm better without it, you know? And, and so I, I um, Thanks. But one of the ways I've been able to do that is by getting cardio in the morning and just kind of burning all the, you know, like hyperactivity out of my system yeah. by, you know, like hitting a heavy bag and, you know, like playing tennis and, you know, jumping up a rock wall and just doing whatever to, to you know, run around in circle. Like when I'm stressed these days, what I will do is I will go, I will, I will get up from my desk and I'll just start running laps around the block. <laughs> until I have enough endorphins to numb whatever problem I had. And then I'll sit back at my desk and, and get back to work. That's not a bad idea. Thanks. Yeah. You can, you can take it. It's yours. <laughs> so. I can't, I'm not a, like, I like playing tennis, but I'm terrible at it. Like really bad, but I do get better. I will never get better. <laughs> it's not for me. I played tennis in high school. My sophomore year, my coach pulled me aside and he asked like, do you think this is the sport for you? What an asshole. <laughs> but also he was right. I'm still not any better. He wasn't wrong. Yeah, I don't know. I've been going to coaches, which helps. I've been um, just, I don't know, forcing myself to think differently about it. Uh, and there's some other ways of doing that that I'll get into offline. But like, I think just never taking for granted the habit that you've formed and, and always trying to think of like, why am I running at the net the way that I am? Or why am I, you know, um, always, why am I standing there and not more on my feet and try to fight that? So what I found is like, if I jump up and down when I'm at the service line, like I'm, you know, at a rave or something and I'm like, yeah. you know, like I, I, I'm more dynamic. And, and so I, I'm more likely to, to get up off my ass faster and sprint to where the ball's at. And like, I drill on all of it over and over and over. So like, I, I will, you know, see how fast I can run across the court. I mean, when I have a coach, like I'm basically paying them to be a human ball machine that gives me tips. Like they'll just serve me, you know, like two or 300 balls and we'll just work on muscle memory and, and train it into the cerebrum. And then like, I don't know, like I, I, I like going to the shooting range as well. And like one of my mentors there was like, you know, it takes a hundred shots to break a bad habit. And I mean, the same is true of tennis, like, and probably yeah. anything where you have physical muscle memory and you're trying, I'm sure I've got some bad workout habits that you could help me correct. Like, you know, I mean, like, as long as you're active and doing something that's so important. Like I think, so I have systemic lupus and I look at all of these um, men and women that have the same disease as I do, but they're not active brutal. and they're in so much pain and discomfort and what a huge difference just being active and exercising makes for your muscles and keeping you loose and limber and building muscle it's amazing and pain management too that's awesome so it actually helps with the pain mitigation to, to just be 100 percent. that's interesting it's made all of the difference so i used to work out like two or three days a week and i totally switched it up and i decided i was going to do six days a week consistently Fuck me, um, that's awesome and it made a huge yeah. i was off any pain meds no ibuprofen no advil no tylenol nothing nice yeah it was crazy and i told my doctor that and he's like wow and i'm like it's true this is a different doctor than the one that said you were gonna die like over a decade ago right <laughs> there were a few of those Fuck. they were wrong <laughs> thank, thank i'm God telling you 
health care god just well you know well your dad is my dad's awesome. a, my dad's a surgeon <laughs> yeah but he's like one of the good ones he's Thank one you. of the good ones yeah, well, I mean, we've all gotten a call together and talked about yeah. ways to make it work. Thank you. I, yeah, he's a good dude. Uh, we haven't always gotten along, but him and I are very good friends these days. Actually, I'll, let me tell you about my Thanksgiving this year. This will come out after Thanksgiving by like a few days, but I'll tell you about what my Thanksgiving's going to be because we're recording this on Tuesday. And so what my Thanksgiving's going to be is I bought like um, a whole bunch of like hot pot meat from like Dim Sum King at a local like... Uh, Asian grocer and then I bought um, like uh, shrimp balls with caviar in the middle and I, I bought like all this different like Chinese and Japanese and Korean food and I'm just gonna cook up a storm you know like utilizing <laughs> shortcuts like the air fryer and like a cast iron skillet and sounds like, good thank you very much yeah I love cooking we'll, we'll have to cook sometime um, and so my mom's making like you know she's got whatever she's doing and it just my parents live in Manhattan. I live in Pittsburgh, and so it's about a six-hour drive. And I've got meetings on Wednesday and on Friday, and Thanksgiving is on Thursday. And so I'm just trying to. I don't know. I, I can't afford the commute, and like you know, for sure, I haven't looked at flights, but I'm just guessing they're booked up solid. Like there's no way I can fly to New York in the morning and then fly out in the evening on Thanksgiving. And so, yeah. you know, it is what it is. And so, I um. I, I just want to hang out with them on Zoom, and then what I'll do is I'll just cook up my storm, and they'll cook up their storm, and um, we'll probably have a few cocktails together and just bullshit, and it should be fun. That sounds nice. Thanks. What are your plans? Not as nice as yours. Fun. All of my family is coming to my house. Ah. So, yeah. Sounds like well, my parents day. don't see this. Sorry, mom and dad, if you ever watch this. Um, so me and my, my sister have not I... watched a single episode of this. <laughs> <laughs> me and my sister are just going to make sure we're drunk enough to like contain all of the politics and arguing and fighting. That Fuck me, that's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, that's what alcohol is for: is putting up with family members. I hate to say it; it's gonna sound. <laughs> no, bad, it's true. But... Yeah, it's for sure. It is funny sometimes, though, when you get ones that are politically different in the same room. And even if, like, you know, they're, like, maybe radically way more one way than you the other way. Like, it was it was funny seeing, like, my... I have these family members that, like, donate aggressively to the Democratic Party, like, in, in the order of, like, probably millions of dollars. And then I have, like, another family member that carries a pistol in his back pocket every day. I mean, he died, but for, the, for his whole life he did that. And so, like, he showed me his pistol on the um, the patio of my other aunt's house that, like, just donates <laughs> to the devil. And I just thought it was the funniest thing because of the contrast. <laughs> but it's just like, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not, like, I don't really hardcore agree with anyone or disagree with anyone. I'm just an observer. And so, Same. Just, yeah, just looking at it, it, it's it's just hilarious to see the, the like if this person knew what that person was doing they would be losing their mind <laughs> but because they don't like nobody cares and and that to me is funny as an instigator and so so i like to mess with my dad purposefully like um he was over here a couple months ago and i told him i'm like hey yeah i'm thinking about getting an electric car because i know that's like a trigger for him and he's that's like, funny do you know how electric cars get here in diesel trucks? <laughs> and then he went like, on. That's a good like, counter argument. <laughs> and then it was like 25 minutes later before anyone could even get a word in. And I'm just sitting back laughing because that was like the whole point of me bringing it up. That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> I'm trying to think like my dad admitted to me that he's an atheist after like on my I was 30 years old when he finally told me he just didn't believe in God. And I'm like, why'd you make me go to synagogue all those years? He's like, uh. <laughs> it's like no answer. There is no answer for that. Yeah. Like, like cultural identity, you know? Like, all right, dad. Um, I guess he's seen some stuff though, right? Yeah. Yeah. For, well, I honestly, to be, I, I'm, not religious myself and i don't think i've ever brought this up on the podcast so here's me coming out of the closet on that but like i think um you know there's been a few times where like I i've been in difficult you know like life or death or just challenging situations 
And I, I've thought, you know, like, I wish I believed in God right now because this would be way less confusing <laughs> if someone else had my back, you know, that I couldn't see. No, I feel the same way. I totally don't have, like, a God that I believe in. I think there's something. Yeah. I don't know what that something is. I definitely don't believe that Eve, a woman, was the root of all of our issues. I think that was a man-made story. Yeah, for sure. Men made that up. Yeah. <laughs> like, <Okay>. Absolutely. <laughs> Did you know that, like, women have one less rib than men because Adam had to give his rib to Eve? Right. Totally. Total horseshit. Yeah. yeah I believe that. If no. you've seen Ari Shafir's, uh, I, uh, my stand-up comedy taste, Ari Shafir uh, is like a stand-up comic, he's pretty underground, but he's got this new special called Just Jew, <laughs> J-E-W, that he came out with. Okay, that sounds funny already. It's really good, I recommend it. But that, he talks about it, he's like, well, the rabbis told me that like that's why women have one less rib than men, it's because of Adam and Eve. And he's like an atheist now, but he grew up going to like rabbinical school and like wanting to be a rabbi. <laughs> and he's like... And I didn't learn that women have the same amount of ribs than men until I was in my 40s. <laughs> you know how embarrassing that is? It's like, well, why do you think that? Well, because some guy with beard dandruff told me. <laughs> I, was a kid. I kind of got some dirty looks last night from like a, one of more ethnocentric purists from the Judaism. My mom wasn't Jewish when she married my dad. She converted before I was born. And so if I, I took a 23 and me to try to bond with my sister, uh, who I have not a lot in common with. But that's what she wanted, so I was like, all right, I'll do this stupid, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, what's the word um, for, like, uh, when you care about racial purity? Um, oh. It's escaping me. Yeah. Eugenic. I'll do the stupid oh. eugenic shit. Like, whatever. <laughs> the stupid eugenic shit with 23 me. And so I did it, and, um, you know, I'm just like, oh, 47% Ashkenazi Jew. Uh, and my grandparents hated my mother you know before she married my dad she ruined the bloodline of inbred you know tay sacks more likely to have like you know i mean I, i'm grateful for that like I, I i think the more mixed up like you are the healthier you are in terms of just you know predispositions for whatever you know and so oh yeah yeah oh this is good it's got like way more philosophical than it it always <laughs> does right like it's always like we're going to talk about the the work and this and that, and then it just gets philosophical. And that's one of the reasons I love doing this. It's just being able to talk, you know, all kinds of, you know, just life, the universe and everything with interesting people who are smarter than me. So you're smarter than me. You might okay. be smarter than me. You're smarter than me in a lot of ways. I'm smarter than you in some ways. You're smarter. Than yes. You. you definitely are smarter than me. In the many. shit that you've put up with. Can I, can I tell the story of like, like the, what happened when you went to that arm conference for me the one year? Oh yeah, you can. <laughs> so, I think it's funny. For, for people listening, Nicole is like one of three women that has taken on a sales role on behalf of SKA, which is uh, my contract engineering company, let's be honest. And so, <laughs> and you know, Clive with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA, Custom Robots and Machines. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Um, Nicole, you were, you were good enough to do that. I really appreciate you coming in for a pinch when I was stuck in California, but what you and every other woman I'm stuck in a sales capacity has told me is there is like no shortage of just sexual harassment at those events. No, so no. what, what happened in your case? I should let you tell it rather than, than bastardizing it and telephone gaming it since you're here. No, uh, you can. So there were a couple things, so I don't know what incident you're I'm talking about the dude putting his fucking room key on your table when you were just trying oh. to have a drink and decompress. Like, yeah. oh. <laughs> like just like, yeah. that's how I picture it. Like, oh. That's kind of how it was too. Like, I think, oh, and we were talking about business, right? And making some headway and I'm like, gave my card, which had your information on it. Things were going that. well. And then that's what happened. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I should have expected that. Right. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? Well, I mean, the on shit. behalf of all men in the whole I world. sent you in there. <laughs> you know? so, I, I went. You were doing I a job for me it. when that happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's. It doesn't matter where you're at. That stuff happens, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's fucking brutal. Like my, I'll, I'll never know what it's like because I'm a dude. But like my grandmother tells me, like. When she got her PhD in history, the, the dean of history at the University of Pittsburgh said, ma'am, you should make babies. You know, <laughs> like, this is in the 1960s. 
That's awful. Can you yeah. imagine? That stuff I still can. happens, though. Like, the company I worked for before, that's why I left. It was like, I remember the CEO calling me at like 7 o'clock at night and screaming, screaming through the phone that we had just hired a pregnant marketing director. And I was like, I know. We, I know. And he's like, what do you mean you know? I just called her and I told her she was deceitful because she didn't tell me. And I'm like, I knew, I know she's pregnant. She told me she was pregnant. She's the best candidate for the job. Yeah, she's fucking We're qualified. Not Who gives being, a shit? Like, what is the big deal? What's the big deal? She goes on maternity leave. And then what comes back and you've got a loyal, what are, you, what are clients going to think? That's what he said. I'm like, that was that his concern? On maternity leave? I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. And her and I quit like within the same week. Nice. I can't believe she even took that job. I think she was just desperate. That makes sense. Yeah, that's yeah, what that are clients going to think is ridiculous. Because I can sort of like, if you're like a thinly strapped company and like you're worried about having to weather paying someone's salary while they're, I guess that sort of makes sense. It's still discriminatory as fuck, but like from a cat, maybe even still. No, like, not thinly strapped. Wouldn't have to pay for her leave because policy was like you had to be here for six months. Oh, before. then who gives a fucking shit? Like, exactly. There was no reason. He was just insane. <sighs> That's horrible. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm sorry to her. <laughs> anyway, I like, know. Jesus. I called her and I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, if I were you, I What are our like, clients going to think? What are they going to, like, probably not going to care because people have people. Like, that's <laughs> biologically that's how we how continue going people. as a race. Yeah. That's how, that's how he got here was through a person. Correct. Yeah. My mom, so, speaking of the person that, that, you know, squeezed me out <laughs> <laughs> put up with me for quite a while and still does um she uh she was a corporate litigator like all through my child so like she's like um an attorney she actually does a lot of sks legal which i'm grateful for she's great and we you know we get we actually her and i from seeing each other's work up close have developed like a newfound respect for each other since when you and i met and so something. we get a long way back. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. And so like, um, you know, as a result, like, I've had her. I've told her about like legal negotiations we were involved in, and and she's a sommelier too. She has her like level two sommelier certificate, which is not easy to get. Like your L one is meant to be all right, but your L two is kind of challenging. And so like, you know, she's she's got her juris doctorate. She's got her sommelier. And like wow. she she was like a bottle of wine deep because one of her friends had passed. And so like, I called her this one. And I'm like, what should I do in this negotiation? She's like, fuck them, fuck them. <laughs> I'm like, mom, hold on. This is a prospective <laughs> client. Don't say fuck them. You know, like let's be diplomatic here, mom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was hilarious. All right. But if she I need a, to get out of some trouble, I'm calling your mom. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Please call my mom. Doing your mom straight. Doing <laughs> <laughs> so, she, um, so she told me another story, which was just infuriating. Again, like not a woman. Don't understand what it's like. But like she told me a story being in court in the 80s where like the fucking judge, the fucking judge goes like, counselor, if you keep talking that way, I'm going to have to put you over my leg and spank you. Oh and I'm like, God. she said that. He said that to like the fucking, to like a, a, the counselor. And I'm like, what'd you do? <laughs> how did you, how did you respond to that? Like, what, how the, I would fucking kill the guy. Like, what did you do? And oh. she's like, uh, I said, your honor, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Like wow. the fucking, the fucking balls on you. Like, like, like I, I don't have that kind of self-restraint <laughs> like, to be able to <laughs> endure that kind of shit like like I, I would be fired that very day like you know for I know. something I egregious think you start to like get numb or kind of used to that kind of bullshit it just you know it it, ha it hasn't changed that much i mean look at roe versus now we're in politics again but it's all good honestly like what are we doing we're going yeah, back. Yeah, that was that thing. was pretty bad. Now I'm now I got political. Sorry. It's all good. I mean, as long <laughs> as you're not worried about it, I'm not worried. Like, obviously, there's people I work with that would disagree with our perspectives on this, but you know what? Like, that's okay. We can agree to disagree. Like, that's okay. Yeah. 
You don't have to have one. Yeah. You never have to have one. I, I know people with uteruses that, you know, are against abortion, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know, agree to disagree. Like, I, I think that's a big differentiating factor between certain people. It's like, there's people that, you know, can coexist with people with dissimilar beliefs to them. And then there's people that are like, everybody has to believe what I believe, you know, like, Great. I can't do business with or talk to anybody that believes something. And you're like, what the fuck is your life like? Why, why can't you just coexist? You know, yeah, like, it's okay to have different beliefs. It really is. Like, you can believe in a different God than I believe in. I don't have to believe in God. And yeah. we can still be friends. Yep, 100%. Yeah, yeah so can... I don't believe in God either. That that mentor I told you about earlier, Christian conservative. And we get along great. You know, we get along yeah. awesome. Because it's I'm fun. grateful for that perspective because it's not my perspective. It makes me smarter. You know, like Maybe I'm should... wrong, too. Yeah. Like, well, I don't the... know if there's... <laughs> this is getting to my nihilism. I don't know if there's objective right and wrong. Like, I kind of believe, like... I don't know, I'm like a moral relativist. Like, I, and... That's not to say I don't like believe in doing the right thing for people or like I, I have strong morals in terms of my personal morals, but that's just what they are is my personal morals. Like I yeah. believe in doing what you say you're going to do and like 100% of the time, like, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it because I don't want to be the kind of person that doesn't do what I said I'm going to do. But I don't do that because of some, you know, structure of beliefs or some religion or yeah. some, you know, punishment that I've perceived. I, I do that because I want to be the kind of person that always does what I said I was going to do, you know? <laughs> and Exactly. Yeah. Just be my a own nice decision. person. Yeah. There's two types of people, Nicole. There's dick and not a dick. Yeah. <laughs> so, not a dick. That's what we yeah. want to do. We want to not camps. be a dick. Right. Yeah, that's it. And if somebody else has dissimilar political views to me, but they're not a dick, then we're on the same team. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I, I like having friends that you can pray to Allah, you know, Zeus, you know, Yahweh, you know, yeah. Adonai, whoever the fuck you pray to. I don't care. Like, as long as you're nice and respectful, you know, we're on the same team. <laughs> so that's that's my perspective. Yep. yep. I agree. Yep. I like to have a variety of friends with a variety of beliefs and backgrounds. And because it's nice. It's, I love having conversations about what they think and what I think. And, yeah. you know, we can sit around and we can talk about that and we can agree to disagree, but we can also learn from each other. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm not like a big, I shouldn't disparage, but I will anyway. I'm not like a big Richard Dawkins fan. Cause I feel like he's kind of an asshole atheist. Like I feel like he's like just mean to people that are religious. And I'm just like, why are you being so mean, bro? <laughs> like yeah, you don't you're have making to the do rest that. of us look bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's no reason to, to like just no but I, then again i have coworkers that like them i have coworkers that are hardcore christians i have coworkers that are hardcore jews i have coworkers that are hardcore muslims and like all of them i'm just like you know what like you do you like i don't i don't really care yeah. what your beliefs are so long as you show up to work on time you do a good job. Like, that's all I care about. That's all I care about. That you're a good person. You're nice to yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in the work context, I would say it goes beyond that to reliability and skill. Yeah. But, I mean, in terms of friends, yeah, as long as you're a good person, you're nice to people. Like, that's all I give a shit about. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I'll hang out with someone that, that fulfills those requirements, as we say in the systems engineering world. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I think being like raised Catholic too and being told all of this stuff and you have to get confirmed and you have to do this and you have to do this. It's like, but why? And nobody can ever tell you why. Because yeah, that's, that's what Jesus did or because you don't want to go to hell. <laughs> well, you know, I'm cold all the time and I heard hell is pretty warm. <laughs> so I don't know. That's fucking hilarious. I mean, like, so, like, it's similar for me, right? Like, growing up Jewish and, like, going to synagogue, even though my dad was an atheist all along and never told me till I was 30. You know, <laughs> like, that. yeah, right? I mean, the motherfucker, like, I got to give him credit. Like, <laughs> motherfucker literally and figuratively. I got to give credit where credit's due. And so he, um, he didn't do anything. I was in Sunday school one day, and they told me about Jonah and the whale. And, you know, being the little cynical cunt that I was, I said, you know, well, hold on a second. I heard in high, in you know grade school biology that 
you know, your stomach is full of hydrochloric acid, and hydrochloric acid dissolves tissue. So how did this guy not get digested? And they're <laughs> like, oh, it's a miracle. And I'm like, okay, well, can you explain to me the logistics of this miracle? Because I want to understand, like, how did, how did God pull it off at a low level? Like, what was the... Did he introduce a buffer into the equation? You know, was there some kind of a base that minimized the asset? You know, did Jonah go into like a bubble that had some resistance to add? Like, how did it work? Like, well, it's just a miracle. You know, I had a lazy Sunday school teacher. And so <laughs> uh, they're like, well, it's just a miracle. I like, fuck you. You know, and they, we're not going to tell you. And so I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't really make sense. But all right, I'll maybe assume that, you know, I need to have faith here and I might be wrong. Okay, but all right. So my understanding from, from grade school biology is that people need to breathe oxygen to stay alive. So how did, how did Jonah get oxygen when, when he was encapsulated in a stomach that you know, kind of forces anything away from your face? Well, oh, yeah, it's a miracle. Don't, don't worry about it, guy. It's a miracle, you know? And I'm like, oh, but that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> you know? And so right? exactly. can, you, can you maybe elaborate on that? Because... You know, you, you got a kid that isn't going to believe in God tomorrow here if you don't explain this. I need some answers. You understand? <laughs> you know, so. like make something up. Yeah, exactly. You know, think on your feet, tap dance a little. You know, PT Barnum mm -hmm. this shit. You know, and so you know, was, they, got, they had nothing, and so I'm just like, oh, you know, if they had said that it was metaphorical and it wasn't meant to be taken literally, I probably would still be going to synagogue today. Yeah. But because instead they said. You know, it's a miracle. Is God did it, and you don't have to know any more than that. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> You're lying to me. I don't like liars. <laughs> and furthermore, what else are you lying to me about? And I started to deconstruct all of it in my head. And I prayed every day of my life until then. But once I started, like, to, to take it all apart and none of it added up, I was like, okay. Maybe this is the end of me being religious, you know? And yeah. For a while, I it's was angry. No when. Like, you know, when it happened. Yeah. Yeah. When was for it me, for me, I think it was later in life. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, when I was a kid, yeah, there were things like, oh, water into wine. Really? I, I don't buy that because we would have figured that out by now. If that actually happened, people would be like turning water into wine all the time. Oh, yeah, for sure. No <laughs> sense. So, you know, there was a lot of confusion and I didn't really, I wasn't religious. I didn't go to church after I was a kid, but I think when I got older and you start seeing, you know, young people, I remember having a friend who died really, really young from cancer Brutal. for no reason. And, you know, stuff like that happens. And then you just realize like shit happens. Some asshole priest it, just says, God taketh and God giveth and God taketh away. Yeah. And some stupid nonsense. Like, Exactly. Basically, the Catholic equivalent of shit happens. Mm -hmm. It is. What was that sushi place in Milwaukee like that we went to? There was there was a Japanese owned one that was fucking awesome. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, um, it's still there. I can't think of what it's called. Yeah, no worries. It was fun. I like that place. A great place. Really great place. Yeah. Yeah. What I don't love is the fish tank. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I know what I'm like. I'm going to eat sushi. I don't want to see them alive. <laughs> Cantonese restaurants are notorious for that. Like I hate that. Yeah. That's like going to a steak place and then being able to like pet a cow. You can shoot it in the face if you want. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's Betsy. Betsy's a great cow. You wanna eat her? <laughs> no. I haven't had red meat or pork. Nice. Any kind of beef for like three years now. When did that change? Was it when you got, um, what is your pig's name again? I'm so sorry. Benny? No, Benny. he didn't stop me from eating bacon. <laughs> I love him. He's a great, cute little pig, but I, would, yeah. I was still eating How bacon. How big has he gotten, by the way? So Nicole, for people listening, has this awesome pet pig named Benny. And he, he told me when he would charge people that were coming up to your door. like. Yeah. <laughs> He's good now. He went through like a teenage phase, right? Like dogs do. Oh, shit. So he's like yeah. a person. Yeah, he is. He's like a toddler now. Like I have a little toddler who wait gets teenage to toddler. That's well, like um, irritable teenager. Okay, okay. Like yeah, 
he went through puberty and he hated everybody for a while. That makes sense. Now he's soft. now he's sweet and docile again. Is he? Uh, yeah, has he, he been neutered or is he just? Yeah, he's okay. neutered. Cool. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. just like a dog. He thinks he's a dog because we have two dogs. <laughs> he goes outside to go potty and. That's awesome. You know, he tries to cuddle up on the couch, but it doesn't work anymore because he's too big. How big has he gotten? 130 pounds. Nice. <laughs> but like compact. So you wouldn't think he's, you'd never guess he was 130 pounds. So he's pure muscle, it sounds like. And, you know, like a big fat neck. Nice. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. He sounds great. What's the life expectancy on those things? Not to be morbid, but I'm just curious. Like 20 years. So nice. So it's like a dog or a cat. It's the same thing. A commitment. Yeah. 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 yeah it's a dog he's... or a cat or a pig. They need attention. They need a lot of attention. Um, you can't really, they get really mad because they pick one person and you become like their person. So if you go on vacation or something and come back, they are- Even if, even if everyone else is around, they're pissed. Yeah. My cat gets that way. Like I'll- Yeah, cats I'll, are like- I'll have other people watch her and she's, she's sweet. I mean, she's, her name's Lucky. She's like a black cat with a little white spot in her chest and you know, my ex-girlfriend named her <laughs> like we keep we get along really well but like i um you know i love her but like i like to travel and so like i'll go to europe for a month or like i wanted to go to southeast asia for a month recently and i didn't get to because the covid travel restrictions were complicated but like i i love traveling and so it's it's bad because when i get back you know lucky like for like two days she's like meow now like why did you leave me you fucking asshole <laughs> and, and like I, I you know i will spend two days just at home like you know just cuddling her to make her feel better and and then i'll go back and you know reconnect <laughs> with the rest of my friends yeah animals are weird that way they're, they're very sensitive yeah especially pigs because they're so intelligent right they're like the second or third most intelligent animal is a pig. So what, like humans, apes, then pigs? Yeah, and I feel weird because we like don't eat apes. Why are we eating pigs? They're just as smart. Yep. So that kind of weirds me out. That's one of the reasons I, I can buy eating. that. Yeah, maybe I got to get a pet pig if I want to make this vegetarianism thing work, which I haven't attempted yet. But like, yeah, I think I would I probably draw a similar conclusion if I'm being honest. Like, so if you could give some advice to like you i don't know like when you were just starting out your career what would it be oh gosh that's a really good question um thanks i just made it up while i was in the toilet oh yeah <laughs> i would probably say make sure you have some fun and don't be so serious because life is short Amen i think that. that's what i said it took me too long to kind of figure all that out and I feel like no matter what you do for a job or in work or who you work with, you want to make sure that you have fun every single day or what's the point. Yeah. makes perfect sense. Yeah. By the way, can I say that the reason I don't drink water at night to this day is because of your advice? What did I tell you? You were like, Are you, you don't drink water when you go to bed because you want to be able to wake up and not be pissing like 70,000 times. In the morning. Oh yeah. I totally no water, no liquid after typically like after dinner. Yeah. I don't want to get up at two o'clock in the morning. I'm the same way now because of your, you telling me that I'm like, Nicole had work? the right idea. Yeah. Totally works. Yeah. I wake up with like dry cracked lips from dehydration, but I didn't oh, wake you up 70 like, times. You know, the little jars of Vaseline that you can yeah. buy for your lips. Yeah. Just put it on before you go to bed. That's a good idea. And I even put it like in the corners of my eyes because I don't like dry eyes. I'm going to start doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I don't wake up at two o'clock and have to pee and I can't get back to bed. And it's a whole thing. Yeah. That's a better way to live your life. I, 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 I say that like tongue in cheek. I'm going to do that, but seriously, I'm going to start doing that. So. <laughs> yeah. You're fucking smarter than me in a lot of ways. So if I had to give myself advice, like when I was a kid, it would be get your head out of your ass and pay your dues, you fucking twat. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. I thought I knew everything. And 
I think when I started meeting people that had been doing it longer than me, um, you know, I'm just like, I don't know everything. I don't know anything. I'm dumb. And they were, yeah, you'll never know. Like you'll never be the smartest person like all the time. You'll never be the strongest person all the time. You'll never be the hottest person all the time. Like there's always going to be somebody that's better than you at that particular thing at any point. And, you know, where you're like, there's always going to be something like there's never going to be at the top of every single curve. And so that, that took some getting used to for me. It's like, calm your jets, Sonny, you know? Really interesting that you say that, because I think of like how different, and we've talked about this, how different our childhoods were, Yeah. right? And how I was raised, we didn't, we didn't have anything. And I was no. raised somewhat wealthy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now I look at my own kids, right? Coming from now my daughter, how she grew up, because I wanted to give her everything I never had. Yeah, it makes and we're, sense. we're pretty well off. And yeah, you're doing great. That, but she also has that same attitude right now. Wait, freshman in college, where she thinks like she's you. unstoppable. Yep, and she knows everything. Oh, and brutal. I wonder if that has something to do with it, right? That's interesting. I wonder too now that you mentioned that because like fuck, my parents were doing great and that's my benchmark. And I'm like, well, I'm better than my parents. You know? <laughs> and they're doing awesome. So clearly I'm invincible, you know? And so I bet you that's- Yeah, and there's no like so. concept of the real world or how other people live. You haven't live. been kicked in the ass enough yet. I mean, like it's gonna happen, mm -hmm. but it, it hasn't be. happened yet. She will experience it. Yeah, it uh, just is gonna take, she's been sheltered. Yep. And for me, I didn't have that. It was like right away getting my ass kicked. Yep. Which breeds humility at a younger age. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. I think it does. Yeah. I wouldn't change. I don't think I would change anything. Maybe yeah. a few things, but I don't know. I don't know. Like in my life, I mean, I would say I would change a few things, but then I wouldn't end up where I am today. And I'm pretty happy with oh. that. And so. People say that about like my illness and because you know, would you change anything if you could? And I, I don't think I would. It sucks. It would be awesome to be a healthy person. I wonder what that's like to like feel like a normal, healthy person. But at the same time, I wouldn't have had all of the experiences I've had and I wouldn't value life and like every day and every interaction and every person in my life as much as I do. Well, it seems like that life is short mentality that you've got, like have fun. Like that's got to yeah. come from that, right? Like, I mean, that's that's got to be related. And yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, as you and I have talked about this, like I've experienced trauma, like different trauma than you, but I've, yeah. I've been through my own shit. And I think it makes you better. Like I, I quote you on this. I'm like, my friend Nicole talks about post-traumatic growth, you know, and yeah. Yeah. And One of my favorite things. Yeah, it's, it's definitely awesome. And I think it makes you a better person. And I'm not trying to say like we should traumatize everybody, you know, but like at the same time, like, yeah, a little bit. Well, COVID, we kind of did that to some extent. Yeah. Just know? like a little bit of trauma. Yeah, it that's makes what it was. It was a little bit. It was trauma junior for like for normies. Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. And so like that that basically was it. But like someone like you or me, I think did really well in that economy because everybody else was losing their head and you and I had already experienced some version of it. And so it was like, right. you know, like, this is nothing. Like, this got is this. nothing. Yeah. What are you guys worried about? Chill out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always think right. that, like, I always bring myself back. Like, why are you freaking out about this? You've been through way worse. And that like helps me come back to the moment and kind of chill out. Yeah. That's, I got to remind myself of that constantly. Mm -hmm. Well, the other one that helps me, I think, is don't worry about the things you can't control. So like one of my mm -hmm. one of my mentors said that to me and there's so many things I can't control that are you have an inclination to worry. Or I have an inclination to worry about like you know, politics or, you know, like, I don't know, just even like elements of my work that are just outside my control where it's just, you know, like I only have responsibility over these things and ability to influence these things. And if I start worrying about those things, that I'm not as good at managing these things. And so yeah, it's like scope it in, chill out, you know, and, and just yeah. do your job. 
And your job is to, you know, get people out of their own way and make sure people have the resources they need to succeed. Mm -hmm. That's me talking to me. (laughs) Yeah, just like your own little pep talk. I do that. Yeah, nice. Sounds like a crazy person. I don't care. Yeah, no, I'll I'll do it in front of the mirror. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do, like, the vocal warm-ups when you're getting ready in the morning, like the me, 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 before you go to school? I do that. I do, like, pranayama, like, all the breath work and stuff with i don't do that i i was i was in this group for a while that did and i was like ah it's not for me i i admire it because i have friends that are doing way cooler shit than me that do that and like you know i I have one buddy uh ricardo olivares who was on this podcast who was at nasa for 20 years and whenever he's stressed at you know like nasa now he's at google he'll do like he's like then i do my breathing exercises (laughs) like yeah you're a fucking badass dude like i uh you have to manage it somehow yep and that that is the one thing that clears your head that's awesome doing that breath work or even yoga yoga you and i should talk like i want to i want to get some insights on this stuff like i i'm not against getting into it i think you would like it i think you're right i did acro yoga when i was in milwaukee working for joy Right. That's that's I like the balancing you. another person on top of you. <laughs> I don't think I want to do that. It was kind of fun. Like, I mean, I would get hurt or it, hurt somebody else. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was neat because like you, it was like very. I mean, acro for acrobatic. Like it was very. Mm-hmm. Um, it was that. I mean, it was like you learn how to balance someone on your feet, like on top of you, and it, it like felt like interpretive dancey and like kind of. Yeah vaguely intimate and like also like kind of interesting and athletic at the same time like it i don't know it was fun from that perspective i could see that yeah for me yoga is about like being with myself okay totally different thing totally zoning out of everything like clearing your mind focusing on what you're doing and sometimes i'll be so stressed about something at work or home or whatever it is and I can't sleep and I can do like a half hour of yoga and then fall right to sleep. Just clears your mind completely. That's awesome. So what I've found is like when I'm having trouble sleeping now, sometimes if I just do push ups like to, to failure, like that, that sometimes will help me chill out. Like if I just do pull ups to failure or like if I just do, you know, calisthenics, like that'll, that'll kind of help me, you know, like just get, a, I don't know what it is. like. I mean, there's other things too, but like that, just something visceral and like physical where you're not really analytical about it. For some reason, I, I don't know if it just distracts you to where you can do it or if it's... Maybe. Yeah. Or you're you're just tired <laughs> after yeah, doing yeah, that might be it. <laughs> or a mixture of both. I'm grateful. Whenever I meet somebody, do you ever meet the person where you're like, how was your day? And they're like... Well, it's about to be 5 p.m., you know, so my day is going to go great. And I'm like, that's how you live your life. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Like, everyone has some days. Like, I have some days like that where you're like, oh, this was a terrible day. I want to move on. Yeah, for sure. That's normal. But 90% of the time, right. And 90% of the time, I'm like, oh, this day went really fast. And that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. 90% 90% of the time, Nicole, I can't shut it off. And I'm just in bed still thinking about the next day or strategy or like 30 things I didn't get done out of the, you know, 50 I did. I mean, I'm embellishing here, but, you know, it's, yeah. you know, how do I, how do I tap into more productivity? I mean, me as a business owner, like I, <laughs> bit of a workaholic, like Thanksgiving, right? I mean, I'm spending maybe an hour and a half with my parents and probably like six hours, you know, on the business or more. Like, I mean, and that's a light day. That's only only a six hour day. That's 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 a holiday. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think it's different when you own your own company, though, too, because it's yours. That's true. It's your baby. That's definitely true. And I was talking to, I was actually at work today and I, I had a meeting um, where I was in with a client and, you know, two of my coworkers from SKA. And I, can't remember, I said something along the lines of like, hey, well, if anyone wants to work during Thanksgiving, I'll be working, you know, like, and you know, everyone just looks at me like I had two heads. And I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, like, I apologize. I, um, you know, 
obviously, like, it's a holiday. Take the time off. I'm not trying to tell everyone they have to work a holiday. I'm just, you know, if you don't rein me in, I'm just going to keep going off the deep end here. <laughs> and so, like, I appreciate that look that you gave me because that, you know, or just tell me, you know, because I don't have an ego that I have to, I don't have an ego problem. Like, I, I like to think, like, you know, I have had an ego problem, but, you know, I, I've, I think I've been very good at killing my ego lately, and, and that's what you need, I think, in order to do good work, is to, to leave your ego out of it and, and check it at the door and just think about, you know, the needs of the people around you and, you know, what you need to do to deliver good work to the people relying on you. Yeah, I would never describe you as somebody with an ego. Never have I thought that. Never? No. Not even in 2014 when you met me? Yes. Changed my mind. Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little. Yeah. But no, not. I, no, no, not even then. No. Actually. All right. Actually. Yeah. That's kind of you. Yeah, you might be right. I don't know. I've been, I've been kind of. I mean, I, I hang out with a lot of people, and, and people tell me different things about me, and you know, I mean, like everyone else, I'm a self-centered douche, and so I, I like hearing about me. It's... No, you're so you're so much more self-aware than you give yourself credit for. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. I, I mean, I you definitely think... are too. Like, I mean, the fact that you've like lived through lupus and just the crazy shit that you've seen. I mean, you've been like a woman in this fucking day and age, which is just being a woman <laughs> and, <laughs> and gotten your ass grabbed at work event. Like, I mean, I don't know how you do it. Like, I'm, you know, I'm grateful to have you as a friend and and i wish i could be as strong as you <laughs> you know and so i don't know i mean knowing someone like you makes me better as a human as well and I, i'm grateful for your friendship and your insight yeah i feel the same thanks thanks buddy. and uh, yes <laughs> and all of that stuff like it's not it doesn't come from strength it's more like you have to right so it's not i would call that strength i mean some people don't, even though they have to. Like a lot of people will crumble and and yeah. you know fall into a ball of despair when they're faced with any kind of adversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe that's an old school mentality, but I don't know. I, I think that is a form of strength to be able to to do the things that you quote have to do to to deal with the hand you've been dealt. You know, even if it's a shitty hand, and you know that's what it is. But well, we do. So I do a lot of work with. Uh, educational programs for like residents or new doctors and now even you know really specialty doctors focused um, on educating people just about specifically doctors about the patient experience right because doctors are so you <laughs> 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 egotistical <laughs> Oh gosh, right? Just like what they don't look at you as a person or a human being. They're looking at your chart or they're looking at this. And then <laughs> the patient experience is so important for repeat business. So I talk to doctors like you gotta I gotta be would. a salesperson. Yeah, that's what it it's all about. It's like my my rheumatologist who is amazing and great and good at what he does he comes to me a lot and asks me questions. Like I have this case, can't tell you the name. I don't know what to do in this situation. I want them to be a repeat customer and I want them to come back, but they don't need the scan. So I say, then tell them they don't need the scan and they'll come back. Just be yeah. honest, right? And they're gonna need some other scan down the road. Like, let's be real. <laughs> Or they're going to need a $20,000 infusion. Like the money will happen. Just be honest with your patients and don't make them radiate themselves more than necessary. That's true in every <laughs> aspect of sales. I mean, you know, like why would you sell someone something they don't need? Because you're short sighted. That's why you did that. Yeah. You know, because you're a stupid idiot and you don't think about next year or the year after that or the year after that. Right. And so I feel like take that goes this, right in line. You know, like take this pill. It's going to help this problem and cause you 20 other problems. But it's my doctor you that prescribed me Ritalin when I was seven. Oh, my God. Somebody. So um, I don't know if I filled you in. So Ethan was just diagnosed with ADHD oh. um, and they tried to put him on Ritalin. 
And I'm like, no, we're not doing that. Nice. We're going to start somewhere else. Yeah, take him to martial arts. Like, I mean, there's like a lot yeah. of other, like better ways to do it. Right. We're not, we're not going straight to medication. We're not doing that. Yeah. And he was like, well, you're wrong. And I'm like, he's my kid. I know. We'll see a different doctor. So we did. Yeah, and he was did. like, yeah, we don't have to start there. Why would we start there? Some of these doctors are so fucking arrogant. Like I've, I've had psychiatrists act that way with me where I'm just like, get the fuck out of here, you douchebag. Like here's cash for everything that I've accrued to this point. Let me just close out my tab and move on. <laughs> like I will pay full price and I'm gonna get the fuck out of here and I'll never see you again. You know? yeah. <laughs> so... Cardiologists, yeah. by far biggest egos in the world. My granddad no. was a cardiologist. Sorry. No, he had a granddad. big ego on him. <laughs> so that, Probably that's... one of the, maybe he was one of the good ones. I literally had to go to five until I found one that I liked. What did because they do? They kept... Like, what was the, what was the folly? So something was wrong. I was having heart palpitations and feeling dizzy, but yeah. like heart palpitations so extreme that I was having chest pain along with it. Ah, uh, brutal. Yeah. And I know my own body. So I'm like, when I'm. When I a take blood a pressure issue down. or is that no, it's just it was visions. POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia. Okay. Which, you know, can be really, really extreme and bad if you don't get it taken care of. Um, all it is is like tachycardia basically, but heat and exercise can cause it. And it can be really scary. So I went to the first cardiologist and he said, oh, well, you know, this is because you're a woman. Oh, Jesus. And you're dealing with your kids and you're stressed. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we're done. And I'm not paying for this. So I went to the second <laughs> party. And he said the same thing. <laughs> and the third guy ran tests. Listen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm and sorry. I'm like, I didn't no mean it like that, people listening. But, like, <laughs> it's just so dismissive and, and shitty. Like... <laughs> yeah, it was really shitty. Like, yeah. this is stress. No, it's not. I know my own body. I know this is not stress. And believe it or not, I am not stressed. And he was trying to convince me that I was stressed out. That's ridiculous. But I'm not stressed. And he's like, but you should be stressed. And I'm like, well, now I'm getting stressed because I'm here with you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and by like the fifth guy, I was like, look this is what's going on. This is what everyone's saying. These are my test results. Clearly something is wrong. He's like, you need to see a neurologist because this is your brain not sending the right signal to your heart. And I'm like, oh, finally. But being told over and over again that this is a problem because of anxiety or it's all in your head by multiple For professionals. Yeah. For tachycardia. That's like, that don't, that don't make no sense. It was like, you're a type A personality and this is why this is happening. That was another doctor. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like screaming. So there were a lot of co-pays that I refused to pay. And I, <laughs> could I pay them easily? Yes. Did I? No. I spent hours on the phone arguing. I will not pay for a doctor's appointment that I did not attend. I got up and I left. Not paying. <laughs> That's awesome. I finally found a guy, an older, more experienced cardiologist you're, you're, who had seen this before. You're, you're definitely more persistent than me. I, I will just pay the amount of money and be like, I'm paying this, but I'm doing it in protest. I'm never coming back. But like, usually I won't even say that. I'll just pay it and I'll fuck off forever and go somewhere else. No, they need to know. They need to know because yeah. I called every single one of them back and I cash. said, yes, like, what? I don't, I don't want their notes on my insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want that stuff either. But I did call every single one of them back and they called me and I told them, you're wrong. Guess what? This is what was wrong with me and you couldn't catch it. Nice. Because I feel bad for all the patients. What did the neurologist do? Like, what was your, what was the, uh, the prescription? Like, how did you fix it? Um, so they did a 
something called a tilt table test where they put your body basically under extreme um, like stress, your blood pressure. So what, you like tilt backwards, I'm imagining, or? Yeah, you're tilted at an angle that forces your heart to work really hard. Interesting. And if it can't keep up, and they also put like needles into your arms to figure out what your sweat rate is, monitor your heart rate and your blood pressure. That's really interesting. And, and mine, you know, I almost passed out. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you're a normal person. It would be totally they would regulate, but I my body couldn't regulate. So then they just put you on a beta blocker. Nice. And then I was fine. Or they can do like a procedure on your heart called an albration. I can't remember. Yeah. Where they basically like cauterize part of your. It's like a natural pacemaker, I guess. Like cauterizing your heart? Something no like that. that. I'd have to look at it. It's something Sorry. similar to that. It's called an abrasion or something like that. Yeah. That's interesting. Ablation, yeah. maybe? Ablation. That's what it is. Yeah, just because ablation is like when you burn something. <laughs> so cautery, yes. to me, implies burning something with electricity. <laughs> so... Ablation. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I didn't know you could ablate the heart. You're just like, just die, heart. <laughs> You're doing too much work. Yeah, that's all it is, is my heart was working way too hard, and it's dangerous. So you just kill part of it by ablating it. That's wild. Slow it down, but the beta blockers work. That's cool. I've heard good things about beta blockers. Like, I guess people use them before they give talks, and it's meant to be, like, good for anxiety. Yeah, I'm totally chill. I'm a lot more chill on them, for sure. I'm like, eh, whatever. Yeah, I just had Xanax when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> But like I found like the longer I'm alive, like the less I need stuff like that, the more I'm just like, all right, well, I'm not afraid of this because I've seen this before. <laughs> I think yeah. I think you just chill out as you get older. I mean I'm curious to try beta blockers though. <laughs> it's gonna sound bad. It's just um I do wonder. It does make you feel they just make you feel kind of sleepy and relaxed. Yeah. I had, I had a guy on the podcast who's uh, Edo Seder, one of the Israeli guys I mentioned, or Edo Seder, sorry, uh, sorry, Edo. Um, but he'd mentioned um, the band of tolerance being like the amount of anxiety, why, where, but you can get work done. So if you're too anxious, you're above your band of tolerance. And if you're not anxious enough, like if you've got a cat purring on your lap, you're below your band of tolerance and you can't get anything done. So there's like an art to getting right in the right place. And so I feel like that's that's just a big part of what we do or being able to perform under stress. Yeah, like figuring out that, how to I get love to that. Tolerance. Yeah, it's a great, it, it works, right? <laughs> like the model actually makes sense. And so, I don't know, when he said that to me, I'm like, I love that too. <laughs> yeah, now I'm thinking about all the people I work with or on my team that are just a little bit too relaxed and how can I like give them a little anxiety? <laughs> Right? Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. enough. Yeah. <laughs> Just terrify him in some way. <laughs> yeah, the people I work with are not that. Like, I don't know. I mean, we're so sparse with who we bring into projects. Like, everybody is kind of a maniac, like, in regard to, like, you know, like, there's this one guy, he's been on the podcast too, who is a very active participant in, in the active SKA project. Kaz Mastoe, he's the former director of hardware for Bossa Nova Robotics. And nice. that guy's hilarious. Like, we were in a meeting the other day and he just goes, later, bitches. <laughs> he gets out of there. Like, another time, um, you know, I don't know, he's just, he's brilliant. Like, he comes up with ideas that wouldn't occur to anybody else. Like, he is... He is one of the smartest people I've ever worked with. And, and I, I, I say that sincerely, like in a way where like, he makes me better for having worked with him. Um, and That's great. Yeah, he's not, I he's love not too that. chilled out. Like he's definitely, he's chill, but he's not too chill. Like, I don't know. He's like yeah. constantly hitting like a vape pen with like nicotine. <laughs> like <laughs> he probably has anxiety. <laughs> but 
He's he's Who a good doesn't? dude, and I'm grateful that he that he works with me. Like he he makes me better for having worked with him. That's rare. You only run into those people, I think, yeah. occasionally in your lifetime. Well, and I kind of love his like you know like devil may care attitude, where you know he's kind of like. You know, he just seems like he's got his middle finger up, but in a way that's like, you know, he's kind of earned the right by <laughs> being really good at what he does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people people should be hiring that guy everywhere. <laughs> like, he's, he's one of the most brilliant, productive people I've ever worked with. Nice. Yeah. Well, look him up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, but by all means, you can try. <laughs> 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 yeah but uh what else is there anything you want to plug should we should we call it yeah we should probably yeah i mean we'll, we'll be us for a little bit after we cut it anyway so we might as well okay recording uh what do you want to talk about like mars uh, other things you're working on anything you want us to put in the description i think that's good cool. um I guess I could put a, a shameless pop plug in there for Mars. Yeah. So that's, uh, uh, what's the website? MarsSG.com? Yeah, MarsSG. And then we have the return ship website. Um, so if you go to MarsSG.com, you can see the return ship websites through there too. Nice. So the difference between us and, you know, the other million staffing companies that are out there is we have that return ship program. So we're not just pulling and plucking talent and putting it somewhere else we're actually creating our own talent so we look for where the market shortage is and we develop programs around that nice that shortage that's awesome mm -hmm. and then i will do a plug too because i've been told to do this by my marketing people uh, collaborative with spencer kraus is sponsored by ska custom robots and machines ska custom robots and machines You've got that down. I love it. Uh, just this is my first time doing it on the podcast. <laughs> Thanks, <Nicole. laughs> but I did practice it with uh, with James quite a bit <laughs> before doing that. I see like an audio book career in your future. Oh geez, if money ever gets really tight, <laughs> that might be my next thing. <laughs> All right, you're awesome. I'm gonna cut it. 